Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My theme will be to reflect on community and difference as it is expressed in the life of the church. More specifically, I want to talk about the place of synods, of councils, for it is above all through synods or councils that the Orthodox Church expresses its unity in diversity. And then I want to reflect on the manner in which primacy balances synodality in our Orthodox Church life. Let us begin by posing some fundamental questions. What is the church here for? What is the distinctive and unique function of the church, that which the church does and which nobody and nothing else can do? What task does the church perform which cannot be carried out equally well by a youth group a musical society, an old people's home, or an ethnic club? What role does the priest fulfill, which cannot be fulfilled by a social worker, a psychotherapist, or a marriage counsellor? What holds the church together and makes it one? When thinking of the church, what kind of visual image or icon should we have in our mind's eye? Now to questions such as these we may respond, the church is here to preach salvation in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead. Such an answer is true but it is incomplete. For the church is here not only to proclaim salvation in words, but also to render that salvation accessible to us through action. What then is the primary action of the ecclesial community? To answer that, let us recall what happened immediately after the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 converts were baptized. St. Luke tells us in the book of Acts, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Here, then, is the distinctive and unique function of the church to break bread, to offer the mystical sacrifice that is without shedding of blood, to celebrate the Lord's Supper until he comes again, as St. Paul puts it. It is this that the church alone can do that distinguishes the church from every other kind of social unit. Of course, the church does many things as well as celebrate the divine liturgy. But it is the Eucharist that forms the life-giving source from which all these other things proceed. It is the Eucharist that holds the church together and makes it one body in Christ. Ecclesial unity is not imposed from above by power of jurisdiction, but it is created from within by communion in the sacramental body and blood of the risen Lord. This then should be our icon of the church. A table. On the table, a plate with bread and a cup with wine. And round the table, the bishops and the priests, the deacons, 
Yes, and also the deaconesses, the subdeacons, readers and acolytes, along with the holy people, the Laos or laity, all of them together celebrating the Eucharistic mystery. The church's very name, Ecclesia, has a Eucharistic reference. It means assembly, yet not simply any kind of assembly, but specifically the worshipping assembly, the people of God, called out. That's the basic root of Ecclesia. The people of God called out and gathered together for the offering of the divine liturgy. It's worth thinking about two familiar phrases, body of Christ and communio sanctorum. Body of Christ has a double meaning. It signifies both the community and the sacrament. And that's not a coincidence. It's equally no coincidence that the words communio sanctorum denote both the communion of saints, the communion of holy people, that is, and communion in the consecrated gifts, communion in the holy things. So the Church is essentially a Eucharistic organism, and when she celebrates the Divine Liturgy, then and only then does she become what she truly is. The Church makes the Eucharist, and the Eucharist makes the Church. Now that's been the answer to our question, what is the Church for, given by theologians in the 20th century, such as Archpriest Nicholas Afanasiev, and then the greatest living Orthodox theologian, Metropolitan John Zizioulas of Pergamon. In the words of Aristotle Papa Nicolaou, if asked to point when asked where is the church, well, no, if asked to point when asked where is God, we would point to the person of Jesus Christ. If asked to point when asked where is the church, it is difficult to think how anyone could point to anything but the Eucharist. Now, some people have criticized this Eucharistic ecclesiology that has marked the 20th century in the Orthodox Church. I think that one of your speakers has done so, though he's not here now, uh, Professor Nicolas Ludovicos. But to me, without hesitation, I regard Eucharistic ecclesiology as the most creative element in recent Orthodox thought. And it's precisely from this point of view that we should approach the theme of synodality and primacy. These are to be interpreted not simply in institutional or juridical terms as an expression of governance and power, but primarily in a mystical and sacramental context. So let's turn to synodality. It's not difficult to appreciate how a church council is to be regarded as a Eucharistic event. Most councils in the history of the church have been concerned with the restoration of Eucharistic communion when this has been broken. With the question, who may or may not be admitted to receive the sacrament? And most, if not all, councils have concluded with a concelebrated liturgy embracing all the members.
Now, we Orthodox are accustomed to, to think, speak of ourselves as a conciliar church, as the church of the seven holy councils. But we have to confess, with humility and realism, that while we affirm synodality in theory, all too often we have neglected it in practice. It is true that since the era of the ecumenical councils, there have been a number of other important synods. The Council of Hagia Sophia in 879-80, the 14th century Palamite councils at Constantinople, in 1341, 1347, 1351, and the 17th century councils at Yash in 1642 and at Jerusalem in 1672, which affirmed the true Orthodox teaching concerning the Church and the sacraments. And then the Council of Constantinople in 1872 that condemned ethnophilitism. Regrettably, its teaching is not observed in the contemporary Orthodox diaspora. And more recently, the Great Moscow Council of 1917-18, to attended by priests and laity as well as by bishops, tragically cut short by the Bolshevik Revolution. The Moscow Council was in many ways as radical and innovative as Vatican II, if not more so. Now, without underestimating these and other councils, should we not admit that all too often Orthodoxy finds it singularly difficult to act in a conciliar way? How many years of preparation and postponement elapsed before the Holy and Great Council actually met in Crete during 2016? In the Roman Catholic Church, on 25th of January 1959, Pope John XXIII, to the astonishment of almost everyone, announced the summoning of an ecumenical council. And in less than four years, on 11th October 1962, the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, actually began. Just three and a half years. I am afraid this is not the way in which things happen in the Orthodox Church. As long ago as 1902, the ecumenical patriarch Joachim III sent out an encyclical letter to all the Orthodox churches calling for closer contacts and cooperation. This received a favorable reception, and in particular the Russian church replied in 1903, emphasizing the importance of special assemblies of Orthodox bishops, on which the members of all the patriarchates and autocephalous churches would be face to face, as they put it, and mouth to mouth on issues of shared concern. 19.3. There we have the seed of the Holy and Great Council of 2016. But we had to wait over a century before our council actually met. Three and a half years in the Roman Catholic Church and, ooh, a hundred and forget how many uh, years before our own ecumenical council met. Was the council in Crete a success? To me, it was something of a disappointment. I think of the Latin saying, Parturiunt montes, nascata ridiculus mus, the mountains are in labor, and there is born 
a ridiculous mouse. <laughs> After all the preparation, more than a century talking about having an ecumenical Orthodox Council, when it actually happened, and I was present at it, it proved something of a damp squib, I am very sorry to say. First of all, it was far from being pan-Orthodox. Of the 14 churches that comprise the worldwide Orthodox community, only 10 attended. The churches of Antioch, Georgia, Bulgaria and Russia chose for various reasons not to come. The OCA, the Orthodox Church in America, was not even invited. The absence of a Russian church was particularly damaging. And it was also a surprise, for until the last moment the Patriarchate of Moscow had taken an active and positive part in the preparations. Before the meeting of the Greek Council, some Orthodox spokesmen speculated that it might prove to be the Eighth Ecumenical Council. In retrospect, alas, none of us think that. In fact, there were various features which made the Greek Council different from the Ecumenical Councils. In the first place, at the seven Ecumenical Councils, all bishops of the Christian world were invited. Since from a sacramental viewpoint, all bishops have been consecrated in the same way, and therefore all bishops enjoy the same gifts of grace. In practice, at the Ecumenical Councils, very few bishops came from the West, but a few did come, and the Emperor covered their travel expenses, which was quite important. Furthermore, at the Ecumenical Councils, each bishop voted individually, and decisions were reached by majority vote. The dissenting minority at the seven Ecumenical Councils was usually very small. For example, at the first council, Nicaea in 325, no, no more than two bishops refused to sign the Acts. Before the time to sign the Acts came, the Emperor announced that any bishops who didn't sign the Acts would be deposed and sent into exile. And that was what happened to those two bishops. But there was a dissenting minority and that was true at all the ecumenical councils. Majority vote, but not unanimous. Crete adopted a different procedure. Its guiding inspiration was not so much sacramental and charismatic as administrative, administrative and bureaucratic. Not all bishops were invited to the council, but only 24 from each patriarchate or autocephalous church. Had all the 14 Orthodox churches sent 24 delegates, there would have been 336 bishops at Crete. In actuality, the number was not much more than 150. Of course, some Orthodox churches don't have as many as 24 bishops. That's the case, for example, with the churches of Cyprus, Albania, Poland, and of the Czech lands with Slovakia. Another point of difference between Crete and the Ecumenical Councils was that at Crete, so it was decided beforehand, not by the bishops, but by a committee, that decisions should be reached not by majority vote, as at the Ecumenical Councils, but by consensus. I take this to mean that whereas there might have been dissenters within each delegation of 24, yet the various delegations each taken as a whole were all to be required to accept resolutions 
by majority vote. Otherwise, a single dissenting bishop could have paralyzed the whole meeting. Crete, as you will recall, had six topics. And the decision about these six topics was taken way back in 1976. This shows you how slow things are in our Orthodox Church. Forty years before the Council met, it was decided what the agenda would be. The Holy Spirit was not being given very much scope to act. The six points you may recall were the mission of the Orthodox Church in the contemporary world, the contribution of the Orthodox Church to the establishment of peace, justice and freedom, of brotherhood and love between peoples, and the removal of sexual and all other forms of discrimination. That was the first one, quite wide-ranging. Then the second issue was the Orthodox Diaspora. The third was autonomy in the Orthodox Church and the manner of its proclamation. Autonomy, you know, not autocephaly. Autonomous Orthodox Churches are not fully independent. Then the fourth point was the mystery of marriage and its impediments. The fifth point was the importance of fasting and its observance today. And the sixth topic was relations of the Orthodox Church with the rest of the Christian world. Now, immediately some comments spring to my mind. First, the Crete Council lasted only a little more than a week. That was not much time to consider six topics of such scope. It's worth remembering that in the Roman Catholic Church, the Council of Trent in the 16th century lasted 16 years, <laughs> while Vatican II extended across four years with the sessions amounting altogether an aggregate of nine months. But the Crete Council in one week thought it could look at all these six topics. Uh, this doesn't seem to me very realistic, and certainly because of this, I'm afraid the Crete Council lacked focus. Now the seven ecumenical councils met because there was a burning topic, a single doctrinal issue that was causing acute controversy throughout the Christian world. But in the case of the Crete Council, there was no such single issue of burning concern. Were all these six issues matters which are really worrying people in the Orthodox Church? For example, autonomy in the Orthodox Church and its manner of proclamation. Do I find each Sunday at the end of the liturgy my parishioners crowding round me and saying, Father, we couldn't sleep a wink last night. We're all so worried about how autonomy is going to be proclaimed in the Orthodox Church. It might have been much more to the point if they'd said autocephaly, because there, there are real problems. 1970, the Church of Russia declared that the OCA, their branch in America, was autocephalous. The ecumenical patriarchate responded by refusing to recognize this. Now nearly 50 years have passed and we haven't resolved this point. But this issue for 50 years, it was not even mentioned in my memory at Crete. Nobody thought it important. The mission of the church with all the other uh, 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 things attached to it, about peace, justice, freedom, brotherhood, love of people, the removal of sexual discrimination, 
that's very wide ranging. What would a meeting of only six days be able to contribute that would be really helpful to this point? And so on. Fasting, that surely is a matter to be decided by different dioceses, different parishes, by the instructions to each individual Christian, by the spiritual father as to what they should keep from the rules of fasting. We don't really need a holy and great council to tell us that fasting is a rather good thing, which was more or less all it said. So, yes, um, I'm afraid I went away from Crete rather disappointed. Though of the six issues, two were of real importance. First, the canonical situation of the so-called diaspora, the situation we have in the Western world of overlapping jurisdictions. How many Orthodox bishops are there in the city of London or still more in the city of New York? even though the canons of the church say there should be just one bishop in each place. And then, of course, our relations to the non-Orthodox world. Some years ago, the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia said that converts were to be received by baptism. In other words, they did not recognize that other Christian churches had true sacraments. On the other hand, since the 18th century, the Church of Russia has accepted Roman Catholics without even chrismating them, simply through profession of faith. Now, glory be to God, the Russian Church in exile has been reconciled and is now in communion with the Moscow Patriarchate. That's a very positive development. But here you have, within one single communion, totally opposed views. One says, no sacraments outside the Orthodox Church, you must be baptized. The other says, that's all right, you're baptized, you're chrismated, you don't need to have that repeated. Well, you would have thought that Crete might have said something about that. But... In the words of the activist hymn, the council remained dumb as fishes on this matter. <laughs> yes, so I felt that the Creek Council didn't really come to grips with the burning issues in our Orthodox world today. For example, one issue subject to considerable controversy in the non-Orthodox West is the ministry of women in the church and the practice of same-sex marriage, so-called. That wasn't mentioned or only obliquely at Crete. So we didn't really have anything positive or interesting to say to other Christians about the Orthodox position here. So, yes, we had preliminary papers at Crete of a rather conservative character and they were more or less adopted as they stood. The changes that were made rendered them even more conservative than they were before. So I'm afraid I can't regard the Creek Council as a marvelous success. At the Second Vatican Council, and this I remember from my early years, there was real excitement. People were, throughout the Roman Catholic Church, encouraged and saw this as a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But... the Council of Crete seems to have fallen flat and we don't hear much about it, do we? Though you've heard about it from me. However, perhaps we shouldn't be too despondent. 
we might say we shouldn't regard the Creek Council as a one-off event. We should see it as the beginning of a process that we should have regular meetings of a Holy and Great Council. And this was indeed proposed by Patriarch Daniel of Romania. He said that we ought to have a Holy and Great Council every seven years and he offered on behalf of the Romanian Church to be the host at the next such gathering. And that's a vital point. Holy and Great Councils are very expensive events. We haven't got a Christian Emperor to pay the expenses. Who's going to put the money up? But that suggestion wasn't followed up. The Creek Council dispersed without any decision when they were going to meet again. No continuation committee was set up. Are we going to have to wait another century before we have another Holy and Great Council? So yes, the Creek Council is very important. It reaffirmed the synodical spirit of orthodoxy, its conciliar ethos. But that is perhaps the best we can say. The really important thing about Creek was that it actually met. But can't we say more than that? I'm not sure. I may say I'm out of favour in a certain centre on the shores of the Bosphorus for expressing this kind of opinion. <laughs> now let's look briefly, I hope, at the subject of primacy. This is very important in the current Orthodox Roman Catholic dialogue. And I think the first thing we should say is that synodality and primacy are complementary and interdependent. At every council, somebody has to preside. It wasn't the Pope at the ecumenical councils. Indeed, the Pope never attended any of the ecumenical councils. Um, he sent delegates. It wasn't the Patriarch of Constantinople who presided. It was actually the Emperor who presided. And if he wasn't presiding in person, he sent senior laity, civil servants, to preside at the council. That's an interesting point. But there is the question, yes, not only of councils in the Orthodox Church, but of primacy. Who is first? Now, Metropolitan John Zizioulas has rightly insisted that primacy, the question of who has first place, and synodality, the summoning of all bishops to ecumenical councils, that these are joined by an inseparable link. There can be no such thing, says Metropolitan John, as primacy without a council, nor conversely can there be a council without a primate. Incidentally, speaking of primates, I was looking on the shelves of second-hand bookshop, which is one of my weaknesses, and in the theology section I saw a book called the history of the primates. Oh, I thought this might be quite interesting. <laughs> but I discovered that it was in fact concerned with the higher apes. <laughs> well, yes. So, our great guide here is Apostolic Canon 34. And I'm sure all of you know that canon by heart. It is the fundamental canon for the Orthodox understanding of the Church. It says that the bishops in each district are to decide who is first among them. And 
They are not to do anything without consulting the one who is first. But equally, the one who is first is not to do anything without consulting all his brother bishops. So there should be complementarity. Primacy and collegiality are reciprocally joined together. And what is the chief function of the first bishop, the primate? It is to promote unity, to be a bridge builder. So what we have in the Orthodox Church is primacy under many different forms. In the Russian Church, the Patriarch of Moscow has very great power. We might almost talk of the Russian Church as an absolute monarchy. In the Greek Church, the Archbishop of Athens has only a nominal primacy, far less power than the Patriarch of Moscow. And so we have no single theory of primacy in the Orthodox Church. While the Patriarchate of Moscow agrees with the Ecumenical Patriarch that Constantinople has the first place in the taxis or canonical order of the Orthodox Church, there is no full agreement between them concerning the scope and practical implications of this first place. We simply do not have at the moment in the Orthodox Church an agreed theology of primacy. Back in the 14th century, the grand logothete, Theodore Metokaites, said that the great men of old have expressed everything so perfectly that they've left nothing further for us to say. A slightly depressing approach, <laughs> but there we are. At any rate, as regards the question of primacy in the Orthodox Church, this is certainly not the case. The last word has not yet been spoken. For example, we have conflicting views in the Orthodox Church today about the granting of autocephaly. Constantinople considers that this is a prerogative of the ecumenical patriarchate. Moscow considers it's the responsibility of the mother church. And that was the reason for the disagreement in 1970 concerning the OCA. Moscow on the grounds that it was the mother church of the Russian metropolia in the USA granted autocephaly to its daughter. Constantinople refused to recognize this action. Fortunately, on this occasion, communion between Constantinople and Russia was not broken. It very nearly was. The ecumenical patriarch indeed sent a letter to Archbishop Yakovos of America saying that he was to break communion with Moscow. Archbishop Yakovos of blessed memory took this letter and put it in the drawer of his desk and did not promulgate it to anybody, though I saw a copy of it. So the result was nothing happened. Communion went on. Good for Archbishop Jacobus. And he had such a great influence that the Patriarchate let matters rest. Unfortunately, that's not what's happened in Ukraine. In the year 2018. As you know, in Ukraine, there have been in the recent past three groups. The majority of parishes, though it's very difficult to get detailed statistics, belong to a group that recognizes the Patriarchate of Moscow and considers itself to be under Moscow's jurisdiction. But there is a second group who are independent, 
who call themselves the Patriarchate of Kiev, and until recently they were not recognized by any other Orthodox Church. And there's a third group, the Autocephalous Church, as it's called, which was also not recognized by anybody. Now what the Ecumenical Patriarch has done is to grant autocephaly to these two schismatic groups who are not recognized by the worldwide Orthodox Church. The reaction of Moscow has been to break communion. What didn't happen over the OCA has now happened. And I hope that all of you recognize how serious this is. This is a real tragedy for our Orthodox Church that there should be such a schism. We cannot rest complacent with that kind of situation. But that's where we are at the moment. A fundamental division in our church. Back in 1870, a schism occurred between Constantinople and Bulgaria. And that schism lasted for 75 years, wasn't healed until 1945. Are we going to now have a schism between Constantinople and Russia for 75 years? I remember talking with a spiritual father on the holy mountain of Athos many years ago, Father Nikon, and he said to me, Satan is trampling our Orthodox Church underfoot. And that's exactly our situation today. So, yes, here we are with different views of who grants autocephaly and at the moment there's a division, a breach in communion, very unhappy. However, let's bear in mind one thing about every form of ecclesial authority not just that of the primate. When the apostles disputed about who should have first place, Jesus rebuked them. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It should not be so among you. Christ is entirely <coughs> unambiguous. Not so among you. The exercise of authority within the church is to be utterly different from that which prevails in civil organizations. As a kingdom not of this world, Eucharistic, Pentecostal, eschatological, the church is unique. She is never to be assimilated to models of power and government prevailing in the fallen world round us. The bishop is not a feudal overlord or an elected parliamentary representative. The chief bishop or primate is neither a dictator nor a constitutional monarch nor the chairman of a board of directors. Having stated what ecclesial authority is not, Jesus then goes on to specify what it is. It should not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, the Akronos, even as the Son of Man came to be, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Such is the true meaning of primacy. The first shall be the last. Power, says Christ, means service. Exousia signifies diakonia. All genuine primacy is kenotic. 
the primate is the servant of all. Among the titles applied to the Pope, the one that appeals most immediately to the Orthodox is Servus Servorum Dei, the servant of the servants of God. The same title can be applied to every primate in the church. If the primate's <coughs> vocation is to serve others, then his ministry involves sacrifice. He's called to lay down his life, as was done by Christ. Above all, the primate carries out his ministry in a spirit of love. Primacy presides in canotic love. There, I think it is time for me to end.